This is the Good Neighbor Podcast, the place where local businesses and neighbors come together. Here's your host, Mike Sedita. Welcome to episode 141 of the Good Neighbor Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Sedita. Today, we're joined by Lance Lehman. He is the VP of Senior Wealth Management with Compound Planning. Lance, how are you doing today? Great, Mike. Thanks so much for having me today. So excited to have you on and learn a little bit more about what you do. To fill you in a little bit about what we do, the Good Neighbor Podcast was set up and designed in 2020 during covid when everybody had to be socially distant, it was a way for business owners and you know business people like yourself to be able to get their brand message out into the community when we still had to be at arm's length from everybody. Um, and now, four years later, the Good Neighbor Podcast has evolved into a national brand. We have people doing Good Neighbor Podcasts in Denver, Atlanta, Virginia, all over the country. I'm fortunate enough to be the person here in Tampa that gets to talk to business owners and, and entrepreneurs like yourself. So Tell us a little bit about compound planning. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. So, uh, yeah, compound planning, uh, we're a wealth management, a comprehensive wealth management firm uh, that uh, is pretty unique because we have, uh, we partner with robust wealth management technology uh, alongside a uh, experienced and expert uh, human advisors. We think that's the, the best combination to help uh, today's investors, today's planners out there. Uh, and we provide, as I said, comprehensive uh, wealth management across not just portfolio planning, but tax planning, uh, investment planning. To, uh, all of those items together to provide a holistic experience for our clients. So uh, how many folks do you have in the operation? Good question. Yeah. So we uh, we have currently been growing uh, by leaps and bounds. Um, I joined the firm just a little over a year ago. Uh, and over that time, we are now at uh, 20 advisors and counting. Uh, and so it's been growing uh, quite quite extensively. We have advisors. Uh, I happen to be the uh, the only advisor currently in the Tampa greater region, but we have advisors all throughout the country servicing wow. you know uh, clients throughout the U.S. Uh, and presently we have about 1.4 billion dollars under management. And then, so you're you're the guy in Tampa. I mean, this is basically your market. Is it is it generally one? I mean, is would you be referred to as like a registered representative? Like, what is your like title there, are you the one rep in the Tampa market that they plan on bringing on more? I mean, how does that work by market? Yeah, wonderful question on that. Uh, one of the one of the competitive advantages that we have is that we are sourcing our talent throughout the throughout the entire U.S. Uh, and so I'm currently the only advisor, as you mentioned, uh, registered investment advisor. That is a distinction that I'll highlight later. That uh, breaks us away from the traditional registered representatives or the uh, the duly registered out there. I'll get more, more detail on that later. Uh, but uh, I'm currently the only advisor in uh, the Florida marketplace. But as I shared, we're definitely looking to expand and grow uh, and uh, throughout the metropolitan areas uh, throughout the state. But again, the competitive advantage for us is that we're not beholden to any one area. If we happen to find a, a highly qualified advisor in, say, Denver, uh, but uh, that client can that advisor can service clients anywhere in the U.S. Like I have clients in multiple states throughout the country. So, so okay, so yeah, that was kind of bring. So my my next question really is then all the different services that you're talking about, like taxes and legal and all these estates and all these different branches off of quote unquote the financial umbrella. A, a lot of that stuff is centralized. Like you're the point of contact. So if you, if someone in uh, Lando Lake says, "Hey, I want to do business with you," they come to you. You look at their the whole holistic view of their entire um, financial makeup, and then if they need services under X, Y, and Z, you're like the point guard in their to their basketball team. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy uh, in that sense is that, yes, I would be um, uh, the quarterback or the point guard, depending on your sports uh, sports team preference on that, because uh, I myself am not a lawyer. But, for example, if a client had an estate planning need and they had to do, do fully, uh, fully redo their estate or perhaps they needed to establish some trusts, uh, we we partner with a highly qualified estate attorneys uh, in the region, whether it be in Florida or I was recently talking with a state attorney in Ohio for a client in Ohio. We, we source those folks that have that expertise that we that we don't have to bring to the table. But in-house, we do have a, uh, a, a tax team uh, that helps with not just uh, tax advice, but also tax preparation. That's another key benefit that a lot of clients come to us to uh, uh, have that advice provided. So... Yeah, well, now is the time of year. Everybody's scrambling to figure out what they want to do. It, they, you know, they're getting t they're getting their W twos and go. Oh my God, I got to do something here and file with somebody. And and uh, 
for lack of a better term, hide or or uh, or save as much money as they possibly can from Uncle Sam and figure out the ways to do that as legal and as uh, efficiently as possible. So I'm assuming now is a busy time. When I worked in finance. The busiest day of the year in my call centers that I worked in and managed uh, was, believe it or not, was like President's Day every year because mm-hmm. it, people's fourth quarter statements went out and their 1099 or, or you know 1099s had gone out and it was like the perfect storm. So the call center that I r- was running in was running at about 3,500 calls a day normally. Wow. And on like a, on like a President's Day, you were at about six thousand calls a day. Our our call board would would go from zero calls to fifty calls and be in the red from eight thirty seven in the morning until five forty five at night. It was one of those. It was like preparing for the perfect storm. So yeah. let me ask you. So I'm assuming you work out of your home office. Like you guys don't have a branch here. You work out of a home office here. Uh, that is correct. Yes, uh, uh, we we all work fully remote, um, and so we, like I said, I happen to work. Uh, I'm based here in Odessa, Florida, uh, out of my home, um, but working with clients, like I said, through throughout the U.S. Uh, but for example, the head of our tax advisory service, uh, she calls Springfield, Missouri, home, right? uh, and the head of our trading department, he lives in Michigan, right? And our chief investment officer, he lives in Oakland, California. So right. it, it uh, really makes a really interesting uh, dynamic, and uh, I think a pretty engaging culture, uh, despite what some of the critics might say about remote uh honestly the culture of the firm has been incredibly uh tight uh people uh, we just get along really really well and stay connected which is uh i think really important today especially like you shared, shared earlier with, with your podcast starting in during the pandemic people have learned to adapt uh, and yeah. i think that's really the hallmark of this is that you find ways to connect with people you know that is the one positive byproduct out of the covid pandemic was you know, things like this form of communication and podcasting and platforms like StreamYard and Zoom and all those kind of blew up and it made the world smaller. You know, you used to have to, like when I worked in in mutual funds, there were only certain places that did mutual fund operations centers, you know, and then they all kind of migrated to Charlotte at one point in the, you know, the banking area. But, um, but you know, you all had to be in this one spot and everybody had to be under one roof and you had to have this this managed structure and I think the world has found out people want to work. If they want to work, they're going to work. And if they don't, they're not going to do it in an office or they're going to do it remote. And those are the people you weed out and you bring in people who want to work. So that's great. And plus, it helps with your work-life balance. I mean, you get the ability to, I mean, I'm not saying you do this, but if you, you know, if you have to run to the pharmacy and pick up a prescription, you don't have to run right at seven o'clock in the morning before work or 5.30 and sit in line. You can take your lunch break and easily do some of that stuff. So it makes life a little bit more manageable for people when they have the ability to work that flexibility. Oh, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I think that there there are, to your point, there are some people that um, uh, no matter what opportunities are afforded to them, they just don't have the motivation or the gumption yeah. to want to do something, whatever their career is. But uh, for example, my wife and I both uh, happen to work remotely. Uh, my wife is a financial analyst for a very large bank, uh, and we both uh, work from home, uh, which creates its own little dynamics in itself. But to your point, the flexibility <laughs> is is a, it's a godsend in so many ways, and we really, really uh, are grateful to have that that capability. You know, it's funny, my ex-wife and I, when she she worked from home, you know, during COVID in that whole window, and it was funny, even though she worked from home, she would literally go into the office in our house and you'd you'd see her like come out and make a sandwich and then go back in her and you just wouldn't see her. She worked legitimately like she was in an office. I mean, but she's one of those people that is sit me down, this is what I gotta do, and she would do it, and those are people that get the job done, and that's why she's been successful in her career. So Let me ask you a little bit. I mean, are you a native Floridian? I mean, Odessa, Florida wasn't there 25 years. I mean, it was there, but it wasn't what it is now. Are you native from this area or did you migrate from somewhere else in the country? Yeah, the the running joke is that uh, the only uh, my wife and I are going to retire to the Southwest, uh, and uh, by that by no means is that the plan. But the reason that joke came about is that I'm I'm originally born and raised in Pennsylvania. My wife hails from upstate New York, uh, and then uh, we we both uh, after graduating college and grad school, we we worked for a couple of uh, places in New York, uh, and then had the opportunity to move out west. And when I say out west, we relocated to um, a tiny little hamlet outside of Portland, Oregon, a bedroom wow. community called Camas, Washington. Uh, which is a wonderful town. Uh, and then uh, three years ago, it'll be three years ago this coming August, 
excuse me, no, four years ago, amazingly enough, time flies, as they say, four years ago this August, uh, we relocated to Tampa from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, much of our family is on the East Coast, Pennsylvania, the Carolinas, uh, New York, etc. So we wanted to migrate back to be closer to them. Uh, and my wife has always had a, had a dream of living in Florida, and uh, she is definitely a, a beach bum. She loves the beach. Uh, so uh, uh, that's where we came. We made the opportunity, took the took the opportunity to move here, and it's been wonderful. We enjoy it, uh, and we hopefully this will be our last stop, as they say, uh, because uh, well, it better be. We, we just purchased some land in Odessa here recently that we're looking to build a house on uh, not terribly distant future. So you know, it's funny is four years ago, four years ago in August, so like right in the middle of like the Omicron variant when all that was mm -hmm. going on, you guys were getting out of out of Oregon. Um, Odessa, the nice thing about that area, Odessa, Trinity, and Keystone, that whole little section in Pasco County, is you could actually still buy like an acre or two and build what you want to build and make it the way you want to make it. Now, it's a little bit more expensive than it was five years ago, but you still have that option to do that. And I think the, the trend actually is that everything is starting to go a little bit further north, like where Angeline mm -hmm. is going to go, up, up 41 and all that. So it's spreading out quite a bit. So it's a nice little, it's kind of a nice little nook in there in that Odessa Trinity Keystone area. I, I like it out there quite a bit. I was, I was out there, I was driving through out there this weekend on my way to Dunedin. So um, I definitely like it out there. So you've been here about four years, but tell us, I mean, you kind of gave us a little trek of your journey. Um, you know, where's your wife from upstate? A uh, small town called Corning, Corning, New York. Yep, very familiar with it. Uh, and then, um, and then, so you guys meet in college, and then kind of bounce all over the world together. Is that is that the game plan? Was that the game plan? Uh, it wasn't necessarily the plan, uh, but uh, that's how it ended up being, which is uh, actually worked out. So maybe it was the plan, and we just weren't read in on it. But uh, it was uh, it's worked out quite nice. The the original plan, uh, candidly, when we relocated to the Pacific Northwest, uh, like many people today, that we, we had a substantial amount of student loan debt uh, coming out of grad school. Both of us had, um, and despite our parents' uh, efforts and and financial contributions, we both still um, had about one hundred fifty thousand dollars in student loan debt when we rolled out of uh, grad school. Yeah, and so our plan was, hey, you know, if we want to kind of sort of get ahead, we'll, we'll move out west uh, with this new opportunity I, I took at that time of the firm and be there for five years. That was the plan. Um, and as the old joke goes, man plans and God laughs, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, uh, so that was in July of 2007 when we moved out there. And the reason I mentioned that is uh, those who are familiar with market history, they know and we all experienced it. We went through the great financial crisis uh, from about October of 07 through the early part of 2009, which just decimated uh, markets and uh, decimated portfolios for investors in many ways. So that five years then got stretched to about, um, you know, about, uh, I guess about 12, 13 years we ended up living out there before we finally relocated to Florida. And it was because you were just upside down on your house or... Well, we were we were lucky. We were incredibly fortunate, and certainly not by no scale of our own. But uh, we were incredibly fortunate when we purchased a home and we bought it in September of '08. Which, in retrospect, we were wondering what were we thinking buying a house in September it was of '08. Right? I bought one in August of '08. It was perfect timing. So, so that part played out pretty well for us. Uh, but uh, uh, but we we definitely wanted to, like I said, the whole plan was to re come back to the East Coast at some point, and so the opportunity came about, and we relocated here, and uh, then. I, then I found compound planning uh, here in recent in the last year, year and a half, and uh, have made the journey. So it's been uh, made the jump, and it's been a been a very welcome change. I very much enjoy what I do for a living. Uh, I love working with clients and helping them kind of troubleshoot a problem, solve, or as I often say, uh, take what they view as a problem or an issue and turn it into an opportunity for them. Well, so that brings me to my next question, which is a great segue. I mean, this wasn't planned at all, but you know. What is one of the myths or misconceptions that you run into when you get a new client that they think working with you guys might be like it is working with somebody else? Or is there some sort of thing yeah. they have in their mind that you're educating them as much as you are advising them? You know, you know that, that's a fantastic question, and it it, it is uh, it definitely uh, bears uh, bears the fruit of a couple of different uh, ideas that come to my mind. But I'll, I'll just highlight a couple that, I, in my experience, like I said, I've been been working in the advisory world for over twenty years now, and uh, so you have the opportunity to engage with hundreds, if not thousands, of different in clients and investors over the career. And some of the most common myths that I've encountered is first, I would say uh, there's this view, the commonly held view that investing um, and a lot of focus, a lot of focus is put on uh, portfolio management and investing. And it is important, but it's not the end all be all that many people believe it to be. Uh, but the common myth is that investing is somehow easy. 
And, uh, and you can you can even see parts of the industry that are actually tailored to kind of promote or and frankly profit from that viewpoint, uh, whether it be the idea of celebrating trades on different trading platforms. When someone makes a trade, they get a little celebratory email. Uh, a target day funds are another example on my mind uh, where they make it sound easy. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that if you look at long term results for most investors, their returns are typically pretty abysmal. Uh, and the reason isn't because of the investments that they're choosing. It's because of the human element that comes into play, right? You mentioned earlier your background in, in finance and then working in the mutual fund world. I'm sure you, you um, saw this on, on occasion as well, is that investors are often their almost worst enemy as they, they either see either succumb to fear or greed in their investment decisions. Um, and it's they're kind of pre-wired to do that. Uh, and so that would probably be the, the biggest myth that I've encountered again and again is people often discount how challenging it actually is to be successful in their investing over time. Uh, and uh, like I said, much of the industry is is shaped to do that. So uh, that would be one myth that I've highlighted. Um, and a tie to that would be, you know, the selection of a wealth advisor. You know, I oftentimes one of the first questions that I, I encounter with a perhaps a, a, a person who's considering hiring myself in the firm is they want to know what your performance history has been. And um, that's an incredibly premature question in many ways, a natural one, one that comes about. Uh, but before knowing anything more, you know, you, you have to really, um, like you said, kind of walk them through kind of an educational process about how, yes, we're not oblivious that in performance does drive your portfolio return. That That's pretty, pretty clear and evident. But you have to factor in many other factors that go into it, uh, because usually when folks are uh, super focused on performance, uh, you know, I ask them a series of three questions. Uh, one is, you know, what what are your performance expectations? Uh, and then what did you base that on? Right. And then finally, you know, what are the risks that uh, you see? Ask them what they see. Uh, the risks are trying to achieve that performance. And usually through those three questions, you you can either, you know, like you said, sort out. Some folks are just super focused on performance and they're probably not a great fit for a wealth management uh, approach. But the majority of them, thankfully, kind of come to their own own conclusion that performance, while important, is taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture is really what matters. And by the bigger picture, I mean, how do I achieve my long term objectives uh, of my wealth management plan? Uh, that usually is what uh, what ends up being the result of that. But, uh, you know, the the final one I'd highlight briefly there, Mike, is, you know, in our industry, there's this there's this very um, uh, commonly held view that wealth planning is something for the the ultra wealthy or the elite on that. And that is false. Uh, wealth planning can be incredibly powerful for any investor out there. But with that, they often uh, falls into the camp of saying, well, I don't need to worry about wealth management until I'm getting ready to retire. Uh, and you know, just taking a step back and thinking that through for a moment, the best wealth planning that's done is the wealth planning that's done early and it's done often, right? It's reviewed on a kind of an iterative process, right? Because life changes. Uh, and so I think that's something that a lot of investors would be, we well served to kind of take a step back and think that through and say, if I can start wealth planning in my 30s or 40s and, and start a projection about where I want to be, the advantage to the client, to the investor on that is time. They have time to make adjustments to what they can either contribute or what they can save uh, and what, what other strategies they can do, as opposed to kind of being at the quote, the end of the uh, the goal line, uh, so to speak, and then trying to work with what limited time they have left. Uh, so uh, long story on that would be that, you know, some planning is always better than none for sure. But I, I would always encourage and I do encourage clients and, and uh, other individuals to start early and start off and uh, continually look to refine your plan. That's what's going to make you successful over the long term. Yeah, I mean, it's very easy to say, you know, buy low and sell high and, uh, you know, stick to these principles. But when people are up against it and they, they need money or they're seeing their investment not go the way they want it to go and they get gun shy, let me get out now while I can salvage what I have left. That's ultimately what ends up ruining a lot of the gains that people would end up getting. Because historically, what is the market average? A 10% return over the lifetime of the S&P 500? I mean, somewhere in that ballpark. So uh, yeah. people, you know, people try to get in and be short-term players. And, you know, if they don't have the, the bankroll to sit and ride it out, it, it could get difficult. You know, it's one of those things. But the biggest thing, like when I was doing, you know, some of the investment stuff, was explaining to people dollar cost averaging and understanding the importance of a consistent investment in the market over a period of time helps you to get those long-term gains because 
of the way the buying power of, of dollar cost averaging over a period of time. Um, but yeah, early and often is great. I think what happens, I think, you know, there's a trend. I, I, I don't want to I would say I read it recently that younger, younger work, people in the workforce are investing more appropriately uh, because they're they're living at home longer or whatever the deal was. But it was a whole article on how that trend is kind of shifting where they're understanding they need to invest early and often. So that message is getting across somewhere. Let me ask you this. When you, you know, when you're not, you know, when you're not working and you're not, um, you know, at compound planning, bringing in new clients, what do you and your wife like to do for fun? We love to travel. Uh, we we are both uh, both students of travel, as we like to say. We do believe that travel is the best form of education, uh, and so uh, that's something that's been uh, that we we enjoy doing as a couple. Uh, a, a very much of you know traveling to different parts of the world, whether and not just internationally, even throughout the U.S. We love traveling domestically, internationally, anywhere to experience new people, uh, different cultures, different food. That's probably one of our uh, high uh, most enjoyable hobbies that we do. Uh, you know, like many people, we enjoy spending time with our friends and family. Uh, and you know, my wife and I—we were talking earlier, Mike, about bulldogs. So we we, we love uh, love English bulldogs and French bulldogs. Uh, and while we don't currently have uh, either of those, uh, we do like to spend some time volunteering at the Humane Society, helping with their dogs, and hopefully getting more of their dogs adopted, uh, which is a, a personal cause of ours. We enjoy that. Um, well, my personal hobbies, uh, I love to love woodworking projects and I'm currently restoring a, uh, 1930 Ford Model A, which has been a very, very, a longer process than what my wife would like to know. But yes, it's a very enjoyable process, tearing that down and rebuilding it. Uh, I, I like to, I like to keep my hands dirty, so to speak on that in, uh, learning, learning and leveraging different skills than just like I said, stressing your, your mental muscles on occasion. It's good to turn a wrench on occasion. Okay, so are you? What is the plan with this Ford? Is it to, to put it in parades? Are you going to just flip it and sell it? You going to take it to uh, Barrett Jackson? What's the plan <laughs> to do with this thing? Uh, it, it's a sentimental uh, rebuild, actually. Uh, my my grandparents, uh, who raised my father along with four other boys, um, they so the four imagine that four boys growing up in the forties and fifties. Uh, so money wasn't always always um, readily available. Uh, so the my grandparents would often take this Model A, uh, and it's been in and out of the family different uh, throughout many years, I should say. Uh, but uh, they would take the uh, the Model A, pack a picnic, and get somebody to watch the, the boys for the uh, for the afternoon or whatever else, and that would effectively be their vacation. They would go blackberry picking, right? Uh, and so it's kind of a tribute car to them as a sense. So uh, we're going to we're making it, we're restoring it back to factory spec uh, from the ground up, uh, and uh, with this. this what would not be um, a purist would not be fond of our paint scheme, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to be painting it. Uh, the center section will be about the color of a blackberry, and then the the rims will be rims and a Thin pinstripe will be like a lavender color. It's a tribute card to our grandparents. So, all right. So, 1930s Model A. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're getting some parts fabricated. No, I mean, how are you finding? I mean, there's there just can't be a lot of parts floating around. It's like a is it a lawnmower engine in that thing if it's going back to stock? <laughs> uh, it's it's not much. It's a it's a simple four cylinder. And if memory serves, I think it it topped out at forty horses uh, was the, the the most it put out. But they were geared right and uh, the the cars uh, the cars were built right. Uh, that's why uh, a little piece of useless trivia, but why you see a lot more Fords, uh, older Fords. I mean, the car is nearly a hundred years old, and yeah. you can still see quite a few of them around in running condition. Is they were just dramatically overbuilt for their use uh, as compared to the other manufacturers. Ford went really went above and beyond on that. So, uh, but to your point on question on uh, parts, yeah, yes, there are quite a few part. There are a handful of parts suppliers throughout the country, but a lot of the um, uh, items still cannot be found or bought yeah. other than perhaps going to uh, through someone's barn or um, uh, a flea market of sorts. So you have to be very careful on uh, on what you take apart because you may not be able to find a replacement for it. You may have to work with what you have. So. So, all right. So much to your wife's chagrin, give us the real inside scoop. Like how this project started, when did it get to your garage? How long has it been there? Was this, but listen, let's just timeline. It was the, yep. was the, was the model a in Portland. It was, yes. Uh, we, we had it shipped out from Pennsylvania, in, uh, and I can give you the year. It was 2012, if memory serves. So, uh, so you've been over on this a decade now. For going on 14 years. 
That we have. Yes, uh, my, my wife has uh, uh, dangled the proverbial carrot out in front of me by offering to, that, that I could we can purchase whatever vehicle I might want, whatever what dream car that I might be interested in, so long as I first complete the Model A. Uh, and uh, she's quite fond of the new Corvettes. She very much likes those. Even though she's not a, a dynamo car person, she very much likes the new Corvette. So I think that's really what she's gunning for. She wants me to get the Model A done so she can get her uh, herself a Corvette. That would be my I guess. Have a I have a 1989 Fox body Mustang GT in very, very good condition. So your wife and I, we can talk. Maybe we can work <laughs> something out. So, all right. So you're, you're working on all this stuff. This is what you do for fun. You, you, know, you do the woodworking and the, the you know, you work on the, the Model A here that's going to eventually get done by its 100th anniversary. Hopefully <laughs> we'll get it in before then. Um what would you say if there's one thing people need to know about you? Because here's the thing. Compound Planning is the company, mm -hmm. but Lance Lehman is the guy here. I mean, you're you're selling you, your personal relationship. What do people need to know about working with you as opposed to working with any other registered representative versus a res registered investment yeah. advisor? What do they need to know? Uh, it's a, a great question. Uh, back to your uh, your question earlier, tied into that about you know what the differences across your industry. And uh, my answer to this, Mike, would be is that in our industry, and what I tell clients uh, on the regular is that due diligence is everything in our business. Uh, and uh, you know many investors they they you know their vetting process of a, of an advisor. Uh, excuse me, begins and ends with usually a referral from a family member or a friend. You know, uh, you know, Bob tells them that, hey, you should talk to Lance or whoever it might be. And that's kind of the extent. They kind of get the seal of approval. And what I encourage clients to do is, you know, referrals are perfectly fine. That's a great way to be introduced to somebody that has a particular skill set or an expertise that you're in need of. But you really owe it to yourself to do your own due diligence and understanding the advisor's background, their education, their experience, uh, and and the in the industry uh, is as regulated as it is with good reason because you're dealing with people's you know uh, valuable assets, their investments, their life yeah. savings, etc. Uh, so there's no qualm with that. But the industry does a, I think an overall pretty good job of offering this information, but it's often not utilized. Uh, and uh, I, I encourage clients to take a look at uh, whether it be you know the the Finra, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Uh, they have what they call a broker check. It's a publicly available website. You can go ahead and put the advisor's name in. And you also have the, uh, for advisors like myself that are registered with the SEC, um, the SEC has a very uh, close cousin to that called the Investment Advisors Public Disclosure website. Exact same process. You go in and put the advisor's name in or the firm's name in, and you'll be able to see all the publicly available information about that firm or to your point, the advisor. Um, and it's it's there for good reason. It's there for consumer protection so that you can see the, the advisor's work history. You can see their, what they're licensed for. You can see any certifications they might have, which is a big one that we'll get to in a moment. And also perhaps if they have any history of any any client disputes and so forth, you'd see all that. It's all available and readily accessible for the, invest, for the consumer that's uh, interested in going on it. But even beyond that, you know, you, when people are entrusting their advisor to oversee their their many cases, their entire liquid net worth, uh, and then some, you know, you owe it to yourself to ask the hard questions. Uh, I encourage clients to ask and know how their advisor's paid. That's a big one. A big one that people are often, they view it as taboo yeah. or they shy away. Yep. How are you paid, right? Uh, and this this kind of highlights the distinction between the, the industry. There Across our industry, there are registered representatives or commonly called brokers. There are um, a registered investment advisors like myself in compound planning, right, that are paid fees uh, for our, our advice and services. Registered representatives typically derive their comp compensation from uh, commission product sales and so forth. And then you have, uh, as if that's... Uh, could be more confusing in some ways is that you have what they call duly registered uh, or hybrid. Sometimes they're called hybrid advisors. And those are folks that have licenses on both sides of the fence. Uh, so there are pros and cons across the board. Uh, and it's not our place to, to, um, to pick and choose. But we would always encourage clients, you need to know how they're being paid because that's going to tell you what incentives are often driving their advice. Uh, and unfortunately, the industry is is littered with a lot of folks that have not been necessarily looking out for their client's best interest, but rather the compensation that they may derive from the implementation of a particular uh, a product and so forth, right? So along those lines, you know, in short order, Mike, what I would say is really three things that uh, investors should be looking for is first, 
they should be actively choosing to partner with someone who is a, a solely a fiduciary, that they, they're going to be a registered investment advisor like myself, right? Uh, because you know that as a fiduciary, as an RIA, as they are, we're, they're obligated, like I am, to look out for their client's best interest, right? They have to put the client's best interest first. Uh, that's something I, I see being missed again and again by many, uh, many investors out there. Uh, in fact, if you just by look at the numbers, I pulled it up here recently. There are about 77,500 registered investment advisors in the U.S. as of 2023, right? There are nearly 305,000 registered representatives in the U.S., and there's about 307,500 duly registered advisors. So clearly the majority of our industry uh, is in the registered, advisor, registered uh, representative camp or the duly registered. And the reason is because there's a lot of uh, a lot of compensation that's at play there for them to to participate in that. So again, the first choice always focus on someone who's solely a fiduciary. That way, you know their advice is has to be and put put in your your best interest first. Uh, the second, um, you know, ideally find an advisor that provides comprehensive wealth management, right? Not just simply portfolio management. Uh, in fact, I would I would uh, make a gentleman's wager with you that in the coming years you're likely to see a lot of firms go by the wayside, be, the, those that are focused strictly on portfolio management, uh, as and because uh, to your point earlier, uh, investors are demanding more and more value add services. From, from their advisors, not just portfolio management. They, they fully oh, yeah. expect that. And a lot of the stuff too, you know, just as we wrap this up, a lot of the stuff too that's going on is with the advancement of the internet and the advancement of information, people can find out more information about people. Oh, yeah. FINRA broker check, NASD, it used to be the NASD broker mm -hmm. check. You could find out some information there, but now you can find out nuts and bolts about somebody. So this profession is held to a little bit higher standard than it was in the you know, the Black Monday days, the Wall Street days, the, you know, the, the, you know, the boiler room type days, there's still some of that stuff out there. But it's definitely people are looking for someone that is absolutely going to have their best interests in mind. And, and with that said, what is the best way if someone is looking for that next level of service? How do they get a hold of you specifically? Yeah, uh, you know, our compound planning, you know, we have a, a fantastic website. That's the place I'd, I'd direct them to initially, and they can try out our free uh, financial dashboard as well as our net worth tracker. Uh, and then myself, if you have listeners that are interested in learning more about how I might be able to help them out with their overall wealth planning, uh, they can uh, easily book a discovery call uh, through my LinkedIn profile uh, or simply call me directly. You know, my, I can be reached at 813-761-3456. So we will include the website, the URL for compound planning. People, you can play around with that. But if you're in, you don't have to necessarily be in the Pasco County area, but, you know, this is where, where we're located. But if you're in Florida and, 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 you know, Lance is registered in several states, if you're listening to this, reach out, call them directly, 813-761-3456. Lance Lehman, thank you for being a good neighbor. Thank you for being on the Good Neighbor Podcast. You have a great day. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. It was an absolute pleasure and look forward to seeing you again. See you soon. Thanks for listening to the Good Neighbor Podcast Pasco. To nominate your favorite local businesses to be featured on the show, go to gnppasco.com. That's gnppasco.com or call 813-922-3610.